Morning, fellas. It's so good to be with you. And as the others have said, how good is it that we're finally back together? Uh, someone said it seemed like it's been 10 years since we've been together. Now we're finally back, and what a, what a grace it is. I invite you to open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 15. We got ourselves a passage today. If you've uh, looked ahead, we got some material. Um, we were scheduled to do eight, chapter 8, verses 15 through chapter 9, verse 12. We're going we're gonna to tag the beginning of chapter or 19 on to next week. I'll be back with you next Thursday. So we're just going to look at the end of chapter 18 for this morning. Now, if you weren't here last week, uh, Dr. Robertson, he began what is the fourth of five major discourses we see in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, these discourses where Jesus is teaching us all that we need to know and how we're supposed to live as his kingdom citizens, as true disciples. Uh, through this study, we've seen that Jesus has identified himself as the true king. Not a Caesar, not a president, not this person or that person. Jesus Christ is the true king whom we owe our loyalty to. He's been describing for us this new kingdom that he's inaugurated and established, this new way of living. And lately, he's been describing for us this new community that he's forming that we know is the church. God has created a people of which we are included, the church. And typically what that means is, is that we are the prototype of this new humanity that he's establishing. Uh, uh, And and what we're doing is we're, we're living this new humanity as salt and light in this world, pointing forward to the day to come where people might know how life is to be lived. And, and loyalty to the one true king and this kingdom ethic which he's established for us, this new way of living as the church. Now last week, uh, Jesus, George showed us, Jesus is, is showing us a couple of principles about what that means, of how we're to be kingdom citizens and true disciples. Uh, George began by showing that first off, even to enter this kingdom, we'd have to have a, a childlike posture. We have to be humble enough to, to throw ourselves onto the mercy lap of the king. Then after that, we, all, we still have a, a, a humble-like posture, a childlike posture in the way that we relate to one another. We're, we're humble towards one another. Pride is the, is the main issue when it comes to our conflict and our strife. And, and the easiest way to, to destroy those seeds of pride is to have a humble posture. Well, as we come to the end of chapter 18, Jesus gives us another principle of how we live out this, this new kingdom, this, this new way of living. And it's this, that you and I, Regardless if we know each other well or not, you and I as brothers of Jesus Christ and his church are to love each other as selflessly and as sacrificially as Christ has loved us. You and I are to love each other as selflessly and sacrificially as Christ has loved us. And as you know, that isn't always the easiest thing to do. So let's go ahead and look at our passage, chapter 18, starting in verse 15. Hear the word of God. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge might be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even to the church, Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master uh, ordered him to be sold, his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. 
But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. When his fellow servants saw that what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported it to their master, all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this morning where again, after such a long time, we can come together as brothers, as true disciples to have fellowship with one another and to take a serious look at your life-giving word, not that we would simply be informed by it, but truly transformed by it, that we might be your people as salt and light in this world, that love each other as you love us. Would you please speak to us, O Lord, send your spirit and make us more and more like you. And it's in Christ we pray. Amen. At the heart of the pandemic last year, um, you know, when all of us were trapped in our own homes, everything was shut down. I've heard from a lot of you that you really got productive. You did great things. You worked on your house. You read some good books. But if you were like me, you weren't productive at all. You watched a lot of movies. Anybody in here watch a lot of movies during the pandemic when you were... Thing. I'm not the only you know, unproductive person. My wife and I, we watched a lot of movies, and this is what we, we, what we decided to do. I would force her to watch things that I enjoyed, then in turn she had to make me watch things that she enjoyed. So I made her watch every Ken Burns documentary available, which she did not really appreciate. And in retaliation, she made me watch all of the romantic comedy movies that she loves. Now, in my experience, there's two types of people, those who like rom-coms and those who'd rather chunk the television out the window. I'm in the latter, okay? But I did it because I love my wife and sometimes I'm afraid of her. So I'll watch those movies. And uh, one of the ones that we watched, I can't remember the name, I actually enjoyed at least one scene in that movie. It's with uh, Meg Ryan. She played a character named Maggie. And Matthew Broderick, he played a character, I think his name was Sam. And I really enjoyed this scene because they had a philosophical discussion about what love is. And it was very interesting. And so Maggie asked Sam, Sam, why don't you tell me what love is? And so he said the same dribble that was incumbent of most romantic comedies. He goes, it's a feeling you have, Maggie. It's like you have a hole in you, then you meet someone, and, and then, you know, Tom Cruise, you're just completed. Everything makes sense, and you're just happy. And what was hilarious, Maggie just, that's dumb. This is what love is. And she tells him a story. And she goes, Sam, I grew up, we had a family dog. Everybody in my family loved this dog. My dad loved this dog. But one day, it started walking around all week and sickly-like, so we took it to the vet. And that vet came in and told us, I'm so sorry, your dog's dying. A maggot had laid eggs in its hindquarters, and eventually it's going to die. And in fact, the, the humane thing to do is go ahead and put that dog down. All of us are crying except for my dad. My dad got that dog and took it in his arms and went home. And one by one, he got all those bugs out. It took him all night, Sam, but he did it. That dog outlived my dad. That's love. At that point, Sarah wanted to change the channel because it was a disgusting story. I was laughing because I thought, wow, what a great illustration for Matthew chapter 18, right? (laughs) Sam, the guy, was looking at her. How disgusting is that, Maggie? How could that possibly be love? Isn't it true that the world will look at the church and say, how in the world can you love each other that way? It's ridiculous. They look at us as if we're crazy. Because here's the deal. The world has a very superficial understanding of love, kind of like Sam. It's, it's emotional. It's transactional. Love, whether it's with a spouse or just a friend, is ultimately about you. And as soon as it begins to cost you something, and as soon as it begins to make you feel uncomfortable, not only is it recommended, but even advisable to cut bait and run from that person. The Bible says, uh-uh. True Christian love is gritty. True Christian love is difficult and usually makes you feel uncomfortable. True Christian love is sacrificial. In fact, the Christian love that that Jesus and Paul and elsewhere talk about, it's not of this world because the love that you and I are to have for one another 
is the very love of Jesus Christ, which is the definition of being other-centered. And it's this type of love, this this costly love, this uncomfortable love, this gritty, action-oriented, face-in-the-mud, run-into-the-burning-house, band-of-brothers type of love that Jesus says honors God. That Jesus says in this passage causes the rest of the world to wonder. And it's this type of love that enables you and I to flourish as the people of God and marks out true disciples of Jesus Christ. What Jesus is saying in this passage as as his disciples, you and I are not to have a superficial love for one another. You and I are to have the selfless, sacrificial, other-centered action-oriented love for each other, the same type of love that Christ has had for us. And it's that love that honors God. And it's that love that enables us to flourish. And it's that love that causes the world to wonder and awe what in the world is going on with those men. And amen. Now Jesus, he gives us two very practical conversations here. Two very practical instances of how we live this out practically in day-to-day life, in kingdom life, in church life as brothers. The world will know that we are disciples in the way in which we love one another. And Jesus has given us two very practical but still two very difficult scenarios of how you and I are to carry this out. A few observations. The first one comes from verses 15 through 20. You and I are to love each other this way when we pursue one another like Christ. We see this in verses 15 through 20. Now, this passage is essentially the foundational passage for church discipline. Uh, Verses 15 through 20. Not all of it is church discipline. Some of it is from benign steps that Jesus will give us. We'll look at that in a moment. But this, sure enough, is the foundational passage for church discipline. And because of that, there's been many Christians who have not really enjoyed these verses. It makes them feel uncomfortable. There are many churches in America and across the world, in our own city, that don't practice these verses at all. I was having a conversation with a guy a couple of weeks ago, one of my dear friends, that his mind was blown that we practice church discipline here at Second. And the reason for that are a couple of, a couple of reasons. First off, we live in a very individualistic society. Most cultures in the world are very communal. They care about community, they care about the health of the community, and they have no bones of, of putting their noses into other people's business. But here in America, we're highly individualistic. And we know that. I mean, we don't like to put our noses in other people's businesses because that means they're probably going to put their nose in our business and we don't want them sniffing around. We want to be accountable to ourselves. We don't want to be accountable to anybody else. You do you, let me do me. I'll get this figured out. Don't worry about it. We're a highly individualistic culture. That's one reason that a lot of folks and a lot of Christians and a lot of churches don't like these verses. Another reason, too, is because it's just easier to avoid these verses. Right, Because if we live these out faithfully, what it means is is that we're going to have to step into other people's messes. And why would we intentionally want to do that when we ourselves have enough messes on our own plate? I don't have time to worry about what you're going through, so I'm going to turn a blind eye because I have all this other stuff going on in my life. I don't have time to worry about and to get dirty dealing with whatever it is you're going through. It's just easier to turn a blind eye. And another reason, just surfacy, it just seems unkind right? to to nose our way into other people's business. I submit to you, all those objections, as right as they may seem, are as a result of having a romantic comedy, culturalistic, self-centered type of love. Because all those objections at the end of the day have nothing to do with the other person. It has everything to do with us maintaining some sense of comfortability, right? This is love, verses 15 through 20, every single one of them. And for us to understand that, why church discipline, even in its, its, its most difficult form at the end of this passage, the, the reason that's love, and we have to understand how this fits in its context. Verse 14, this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, we are told that it's not the will of the Father that even one of his little ones should perish. Jesus, in verse 14, what, what George talked about last week, said, it is the will of the Father not that not one of his little people, not one of his little sheep, not one of his little precious ones in this room Should perish. That's how we ended last week. Now, in verse 15, we are told what you and I should do as brothers in Jesus Christ when one of us should get on a path that would lead to our spiritual destruction. 
Do you see the logic there? Jesus is saying, listen, everybody in this room, if you, are, if you are in me, if you believe in me, you are precious to me. I love you more than you could ever possibly imagine, and I'm going to do everything to get you home. And then in verse 15, that includes using a bunch of knuckleheads that are sitting around you that I call the church as the mechanism of how I'm going to get you home. Church discipline, verses 15 through 20, is a manifestation of God's pursuing love for us. He loves us, and he calls us to love one another. Now, we know as Christians, we're always in need of correction. We're always repenting. That's the Christian life. We live a repentant lifestyle. None of us are perfect. We're we're kind of like in a pinball machine. We're just always walking off course, and someone corrects us and, and helps us to see our sin and follow Jesus until we repent and we're following the Lord that way. That, that always works out. I got corrected twice this morning by Sarah as I was walking out the door, which I was thankful for. We're always correcting each other. And when we're in our right minds, we repent and that's it. But what happens when our dear brothers and sisters don't repent? Or when it's hard for them to repent? When their feet are just stuck in the mud? Because that's difficult, right? What are you supposed to do in those instances? How are we to love one? Well, Jesus shows us. In verses 15 through 20, this is what you do, brothers. When my little ones are having trouble following me. And he gives us a very practical how-to. Now, in 15a, he first shows us when to do this. Which I'm very thankful for, right? Because there's many times in our lives, you know, use marriage as an example. You know, there's things that come up in marriage that you're thinking to yourself, now, is this really worth the argument that I'm about to have? I mean, this thing could take me all night. Is this, is this molehill worth the art? You know, when is it appropriate to engage someone? Well, Jesus tells us in 15a, when your brother sins against you. So that's when. That's when we engage each other and pursue each other as Christ has pursued us. When our brother sins against us. Now, again, that's a little generic, right? Because... Again, how do we know that my brother has truly sinned against me? How how do I know that I'm not just being sensitive, that I'm not just making a big deal out of nothing? A few pastors and a few scholars have fleshed this out for us, including Cindy Wilson. I remember him uh, talking about this. He said, here's three scenarios of when this applies. First off, when a brother or a sister has offended you in such a way that your relationship has been negatively affected. So regardless if they intended to sin against you or if you've just misinterpreted what happened, but if they've done something, if something has happened that your relationship with this person has been negatively affected, which means that you have something against them in your heart. In that instance, you are to engage them. Secondly, say this person sins, but it's not against you, but it's wildly known in the people in the church or even outside in the community. In those instances, you engage them. Why? Because Christ's honor is at stake. We're not only concerned about our holiness and the holiness of our brothers, we're concerned about the holiness of the church and the honor of Jesus Christ. And if someone's misrepresenting the Lord out in the community, we engage them. Thirdly, if someone sins, um, but it's not against you and it's not wildly known, do we engage them then? Yes. Because if we know something is toxic in our brother's or sister's life, why in the world would we not engage them if it's toxic to their souls? So in these three instances, Jesus is saying, hey, my little ones are in trouble. Your brothers are in trouble. Now love them as I have loved you. That's when. Now the second thing that Jesus shows us is how. And we see this in verses 15b through 19. How do we do this? Because again, it's difficult. We're talking about putting our noses in other people's business, stepping into other people's messes, and that's just uncomfortable. How do we do this? Well, thankfully, Jesus gives us a step-by-step. First off, talk to this person gently. Whoever it is, go to that person gently. This is the first step, and it's very benign. You just go talk to this guy. Whatever it is, you talk to him about it. Think about how countercultural that is, first off, especially if this sins against you, right? Because we live in a world when people are offended, two things usually happen. One, The offended party ignores that person. Or, in our culture, they just outright cancel that person. (laughs) They want to get their pound of flesh and ruin that person's life. We see that time and time again in our culture. But in a culture, the world says, get your vengeance, get your pound of flesh. This is what Jesus says. I want you to love that brother. 
I want you to enter into their life. I want you to engage them, and I want you to bring them home. And the way that we do that, first off, is by being gentle. We get this from Paul, whose comments on this section in Galatians 6.1, where Paul literally says, Brothers, when one of you is caught in transgressions, I want you to seek to restore that person with a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness. Paul will later say in Galatians 6 is a fruit of the Spirit, which we know is a character quality of Jesus Christ. So again, how countercultural is this? Uh, Jesus is saying, Paul is saying that when you engage your brother, when you approach them with whatever the offense is, don't act like the world. You, you act like Jesus Christ. You, you, t- you put on his character as you engage these people. You're not trying to win an argument like we sometimes do. Right? We, we usually want to win the fight. We want to win the argument and prove ourselves right. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to win a human being. Which means, first off, we're looking for innocence, right? We're not looking to be right, so we hope that we're wrong. And so I go to Brandon, my good friend. Brandon, you said this to me, and I might have misheard you. Did you mean this? Or I heard that you were doing this. Is that true? You ask poignant questions as, as God does in the garden, as Jesus does at the well, but, but, but you're gentle about it. Now, if they prove to be not innocent, we're not looking for recompense. What are we looking for? We're looking for restoration. We're looking to restore these people because they are our brothers or our sisters. Now, this is difficult, absolutely, especially if the sin's against you. But if I interpret Leviticus 19 correctly, if we don't do this, we might as well hate our brothers. So I guess the question is that Jesus is posing here, do we love one another enough? Do you love the person sitting next to you this morning eating breakfast enough to step into their mess? So thankfully, that usually works. But if it doesn't, he gives us a second step. Take one or two other people with you. Now, when Jesus suggests this, when he tells us this, it's not a suggestion, when he tells us this, He's not imagining that we're trying to find eyewitnesses to whatever the offense was, because usually there's not a whole bunch of eyewitnesses. What he's essentially saying is take one or two objective people with you that make sure that you're not acting like a crazy person. Because isn't it true, oftentimes when we're in conflict with one another, we have a hard time thinking objectively. Our feelings have been hurt, right? So we need outside people that can come in. We're, We're not gossiping. Because our mission is not to tear each other down. We're loving each other. We want to build each other up. And we're not getting our best friends either that are just going to be our yes men. We're getting objective people to come alongside us to say, hey, am am I seeing this right? Would you please talk to the both of us? Why? For the purposes that both of us might be restored. Now, hopefully that works. But if it doesn't, thirdly, he says, now take it to the church. Now, this is usually where we get a little skittish. Right? Because this is becoming a big deal now. I've done my best. I don't want to get this guy in trouble. I mean, I'm just going to let bygones be bygones and not. Don't think that way. Because it's not about getting each other in trouble. Remember, we're not narcs. We're not not narking on one another. What's the whole purpose of this? The purpose is to rescue one another from the far country. And we're going after each other just as zealously, just as recklessly as Christ has gone after us. Think about our own biological families. If our kids just decide one day to leave home and run away, would we sit by and say, you know what, that's okay. They're going to make it home. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to continue watching this, this Ken Burns documentary. Would we do that? No, we would go after them with every resource to our availability to rescue our children. If our older children start living in sin, say, for example, our our son starts cheating on his wife or engaging in this illicit activity, would we say to ourselves, oh, that's his business? No, we would go into his life, man, what are you doing? And we try to talk sense into them and try to tell them to, to confess your sin, repent. Seek counseling, do whatever you can. Be right with the Lord and be right with your wife or whoever else says that you've offended. We would go after them. Why? Because they are our family. In this passage, Jesus is saying the people that you're sitting next to are your family. They're your brothers. And I care about them. They're precious to me. Seek them as I have sought you. Now, how we do that here at Second, we we have a session of elders. So what that means is is that when it comes to this time, we we take it before the the elders who are in our church. They've been ordained to be the under-shepherds looking after the spiritual maturity and the spiritual health of everybody in this church. 
We have a system where we call a, a program as Peace and Reconciliation Ministry. These elders get trained men and women to come alongside two parties where some men and some women walk alongside this person and that person separately, praying with them, helping them. And eventually the goal is that they would bring them together and they would repent together and be reconciled. And that happens all the time. And of course it will. There's conflicts in a church this big where brothers, sinners thrown together. Of course there's going to be conflict. And this is a beautiful ministry that our elders have. But sometimes that doesn't work. And in those instances, Jesus says, lastly, we must censor the unrepentant person. Now this is where it gets really hard. And in our, in our Presbyterian, in our denomination, there's a couple of censures. First off, there's a formal rebuke from the session. Secondly, there's uh, being abstained from the, the sacraments. And lastly, what's being discussed here is excommunication. Excommunication. Jesus is saying, if this person refuses to follow me, if he refuses to repent, which is clearly a sign that he's not in me or he's, or he's running away from me, and if he refuses to repent, you've got to treat that guy as a tax collector or a Gentile. And what that means is you've got to treat him like an unbeliever. Now, we're thinking to ourselves, how in the world is that loving? How is this loving, Jesus, for us to treat someone like that? Jesus says you've got to remember the why behind all of this. And what was the why back in 15b? is to gain your brother back. Jesus says in verse 20, he reminds us that he is with us in this process, that he's in our midst, that he's working with us and through us for the purposes of pursuing and reclaiming his kids, his children, his people that have run away from him. And in verses 15 through 20, from the benign step of simply talking to your brother to this really grievous one, all of it is the mechanism of how Jesus does that and to claim his people. Now, we're going to come back and talk about this this church discipline thing if we have time at the end. But the point is, verses 15 through 20, the purpose of it is not, it isn't discipline. Or rather, it isn't punitive discipline. It's not to get your pound of flesh. It's restorative. And he's given the church and he's given us authority to speak into each other's life, not to shame one another, not to guilt one another, not to destroy each other's lives, but to save each other's lives, to restore one another. Jesus is saying, I love you so much. You have no idea. I will let you fall to the bottom of the barrel. I will kick you out of my house in order to make sure you get home. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, that's, that's not superficial love. And that's love that as brothers, we are called to have for one another. We need to ask ourselves a question. Do we love each other enough to step into the mess? Now, the second principle Jesus shows us is that we must forgive each other like Christ. We see this in verses 21 through 35. We must forgive each other. We're not only pursue each other like Jesus. We, we forgive one another like Christ. Now, there's no coincidence that this passage comes on the heels of the last one. Jesus was teaching on church discipline, and so Peter asks the natural question, okay, Jesus, if this is so, if we're really going to do this and get our hands dirty, there's going to be things that come up to the top, and they're going to keep on coming up to the top. And so my question is, how often are we going to forgive one another, right? So that's his question. How often should we forgive one another? Now, if this previous passage, the one that we just looked at, is to show us God's unbelievable and loving pursuit of wayward people like us, this one describes his amazing grace. The grace that he has shown us as his disciples and the grace that you and I are to show one another. Now, there's a couple of things that we learn from this. First off, the rule of forgiveness is unconditional. We're to forgive each other liberally. It's hilarious that Peter answers his own question, didn't it? I mean, he goes to the Son of God, and he goes, Jesus, how, how often are we to forgive each other? Let me, let me answer for you. We're to forgive each other seven times, aren't we? Now, when he does that, he's, he's essentially being generous. He's being a generous guy by saying seven times, because back then, the rabbinic teaching from the Talmud was this. You're only to forgive each other three times. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the rest taught, that you're only to forgive your brother and your friend or another Israelite. Three times. That fourth time, they're out. Back then, it was a three strikes and you're out rule. <laughs> they, they literally practiced. Now, I do that with my son, so I have to rethink my inks on this because I'm completely out of cord. But they were doing three strikes and you're out back then. 
And so Peter says, you know what? Jesus, he's much better than the Pharisees. He's been rewriting the rule book this whole time. I bet he's going to say seven. Seven is the perfect number. Jesus is perfect. So is that it, Jesus, seven times? He's being generous. How does Jesus respond? <laughs> he responds. He just blows Peter's suggestion out of the water. He goes, how about 70 times seven times? Jesus did not say you're only to forgive these sins, but not those sins. Jesus did not put a limit on the frequency or quantity of our forgiveness. He said 70 times, 70 times, which was an old Jewish way of saying, you forgive him unconditionally. You forgive him liberally. Now, there's a couple things about forgiveness. I know we know this, but just to make sure, forgiveness. When Jesus says forgiveness, he does not have the cultural practice of forgiveness that we often see. When he says that word forgiveness, he is not saying turn a blind eye. He's not saying sweep things under the rug. He's not saying forgive and forget and act like it didn't happen. He's not saying that. And those are myths of forgiveness that we see often. I see it played out in marriages all the time through counseling. I do that. I fall into that sometimes. But that's not true forgiveness, and it leads nowhere good. Why? All it does is leave bitterness because the issue is never dealt with, and it's allowed to fester, and eventually it leads to a situation that's unreconcilable. That's not forgiveness. When Jesus says forgiveness, this is what he's saying. I want you to be uh, honest with whatever the cost is. If we're going to forgive somebody, it's because something has been done against us. There's a cost there. And I want you to approach the person who's offended you to be real with that cost. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to cancel that debt. Because it's that type of forgiveness that, that only makes repentance and restoration possible. We, we don't forgive someone um, only after they repent. Jesus didn't wait for us to repent for us to forgive us. He forgave us first, and in response, we repent. Forgiveness leads to repentance, which leads to restoration. But this is the type of forgiveness that he's calling us to do. It's what he taught back then, and it's binding for us now. You and I are to forgive each other liberally. We're to forgive each other unconditionally. So the question is, how in the world are we going to do that? Because that's certainly not practiced out in the world. That goes against every fiber of our natural fallen being to forgive each other like that. Well, Jesus shows us how. And the rest of these verses, he points to the, the logic of the gospel. And first off, he shows us the model of the gospel is how we forgive. We see this in the parable that he gives us. Now, to summarize the parable, essentially what Jesus is saying, I've inaugurated the kingdom. This new way of living is here. All right, this isn't a future thing. We're living this way now. And this applies to you. And this is how you forgive one another as kingdom citizens. He gives us this parable. He goes, imagine that there's this almighty, powerful master. He has all these servants. Now, one of these servants owed him an amazing debt. Right, 10,000 talents. One talent equaled about 20 years of wages. Okay, Most servants didn't have talents laying around. But this guy owed the master 10,000. If you work out inflation, that's about $6 billion. This one servant, a servant, owed the master $6 billion. That's funny money to us. I don't think anybody in here is a billionaire. But if you are, you probably don't have $6 billion. Can you imagine having $6 billion? I can't even imagine. That's just, that's, that's monopoly money. But this is what that man owed. And the result of which, of him not being able to pay it, was a lifetime in dungeon servitude. So he goes to his master and says, listen, I don't have $6 billion. But I'm so sorry for it. I, I'll, I'll just please be kind and patient. And I'll, I'll figure out a way to pay it back. And so this master, he's just laughing to himself. He's like, this guy cannot pay me $6 billion. And he knows that. So what does the master do? He goes above and beyond. He goes, man, I'm not going to give you an extension. But this is what I am going to do. I'm going to take your ledger and chunk it out the window. He removed the servant's debt. And not only that, he freed him from a lifetime of dungeon servitude. Amazing. But then there's a second servant who owed that first servant what is today's value, $10,000. $10,000. Most of us can get our hands on $10,000. We can understand $10,000. And so he goes to the first servant and says, hey, I got this debt. Would you please give me an extension? Please, please have mercy. And the first servant didn't. Not only did he not remove his debt, he punished him and humiliated him. The point that Jesus is making in this kingdom life that we're going to have, 
This church life where we're brothers, we are to forgive each other just as we have been forgiven. What he is explaining here is the gospel. You and I are that first servant. You and I had $6 billion of debt. We had a debt that we could not pay back to the true master, God himself. It was beyond our capacity to work out of or to pay back, and we were headed to the dungeons of hell, an eternity of of servitude. But God in his mercy wiped our debt clean. In his mercy and his grace, he took the ledger and he chunked it out of the window and he delivered us from death and he made us full citizens in his kingdom. Are you kidding me? And now Jesus says, because of that, you can forgive one another. No matter what it is. Doesn't mean there won't be consequences. Of course, there'll be consequences in this life, but you can forgive that person. No matter how grievous it is. Why? Because you have been forgiven a debt that's untold. And whatever they've done to you is incomparable of what Christ has forgiven us. The Gospels are model of forgiveness. And brothers, if we have trouble forgiving one another, if you've got someone in your mind right now, it's like, I can't imagine forgiving that person. What this passage is beckoning us to do is to kneel before the cross of Jesus Christ and contemplate the cost of our forgiveness. Now, the truth is the only people that can forgive each other this way, the only people that can love each other this way and function as a kingdom citizen are those who not only have the gospel as their model, but also those who have the gospel as their power. In verse 35, Jesus says, I want you to forgive each other from the heart. So this isn't a superficial forgiveness. I want you to truly forgive that person sitting next to you. And the only people that can do that are those who have the gospel as their power. Verse 35, it's one of those verses that that cause us to to wiggle a little bit because it seems, verse 35, anti-gospel. It seems as if Jesus is going back on what he's already said. It seems like we could lose our salvation. It seems like works righteousness. But this is what Jesus intends and what he means when he says verse 35. It's similar to what he said to Nicodemus Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Where he says, Nicodemus, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God until you have been born again. And what Jesus is saying here, that it's only when we're born again, it's only when we've received and understood and have rested in his amazing grace, it's only when we've been given a new heart that we're able to love each other this selflessly and to forgive each other this unconditionally. It's kind of like oxygen. It's kind of like the the breath in our lungs. We can only breathe out, brothers. Isn't it true what we've already breathed in? And that's what Jesus is saying here. To the extent that we have understood the gospel and have believed the gospel and rested in his grace, we're going to extend that grace to one another. It's only when we've understood that he's taken care of our debt that we're able to forgive other people because we're, because we're drawing off of, a, off of his bank account. We're drawing off his amazing grace. We're drawing off his love where we have everything signed and sealed. And it's out of that wealth and out of that forgiveness and love that we extend it to one another. So if we can't forgive people, if we don't want to forgive people, Jesus is saying, you have to go back and understand the gospel. Because this is what my kingdom citizens do. Those who have been born again have a new heart. They forgive one another and they love each other just as recklessly and just as selflessly and just as unconditionally as I loved and have forgiven you. It's this type of love, not a selfish love, not a self-centered love, not a a rom-com love. It's this type of love, nose in the dirt. It's this type of love that honors God. It's this type of love that causes you and I to flourish because it gets to the root issues. It sheds light on our darkness and enables us to repent and and for us to be restored. It causes us to flourish and it's this type of love that causes the world to say, what in the world is going on over there at Amen? Going back really quick to that church discipline thing. That guy I had a conversation with a couple weeks ago. He could not understand how church discipline, and even especially excommunication, is loving. Here's a story that Todd Erickson had told me a while back. I asked for his permission to tell it again, and some of you may have heard it. But when Todd, several years ago, was a youth director of another church, there was a kid in his ministry 
the son of an elder who started living a, a very terrible lifestyle. He was doing drugs and selling drugs and in many sexual relationships with people in the community. Son of an elder. That was sticky for Todd. But Todd, Matthew 18, he loved that kid enough to step into his mess. And he asked him questions. Now, eventually, that kid told Todd where he could go. He didn't want anything of it. And so Todd took it before the session. And they did what they were supposed to do. They talked to this kid for the purposes of restoring him. Todd said one elder with tears in his eyes was imploring this this student to repent. He said, please repent. I fear hell for you. Please come back. And with cold and hate in that kid's eyes, he told them where they could go. And so they left him and kicked him out of the church. They excommunicated him. Because it was more loving to do that than to allow him to remain in his sin as if there was no spiritual danger. Five years later, Todd has another job. Working on a Saturday in his office, he gets a phone call. It was that kid. Five years later, Todd had no idea how he tracked him down. The kid on the phone said, I've been trying to find you. I wanted to let you know that on that day, I never hated anybody more. But right now, I want to thank you because God used it and he brought me home. That man is now a deacon of his church all because another brother loved him enough to step into the mess. This is how we love each other, church.